In this presentation, we will give commentary and insights concerning 2 Nephi, chapters 3 through 5. So, let's begin with 2 Nephi, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 2, the phrase, If it so be that ye shall keep my commandments, all of heaven's blessings are conditioned upon principles of righteousness. Whether stated or unstated, virtually every promise given in patriarchal blessings assumes obedience to laws of God, to the laws of God, if it so be brought to fruition. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, the phrase, Great were the covenants of the Lord, referring to, in the Joel Smith translation of the Bible, we read that, Quote, the Lord hath visited Joseph, the son of Jacob, spoken of in the Old Testament, and that Joseph was given great promises concerning his posterity. As Lehi testified, Joseph truly saw our day, meaning the day of Lehi and his posterity, and knew that in the future God would raise up a choice seer, namely the great prophet who was his namesake. That's in verse 15. Joseph knew... Also, that it would be primarily his descendants whom the Lord would call upon first in the last days to carry the gospel to the additional lost members of the house of Israel scattered among the nations of the earth in compliance with the covenant God made with Abraham. Obviously, since the Lord has kept his covenant with Joseph, he will also keep his covenant with us if we are righteous as well. Lehi's teaching is a great example of Heavenly Father honored the covenant he made with Joseph. We can have the, co we can have the confidence that God will always honor his covenants. This is one of the main purposes of Scripture, brothers and sisters, to see that how the character of God and how he treats people in past ages is he will do same in future ages. If God kept his promises and covenants in past dispensations, then he will also do so in our dispensation. That is to help our faith to grow. Chapter 3, verse 4, the phrase, I am a descendant of Joseph. Lehi was the defend, a descendant of Manasseh. Ishmael was of Ephraim. Thus, the Book of Mormon peoples represented both branches of Joseph's posterity in fulfillment of prophecy, and their record is referred to as the stick of Joseph by Ezekiel and the stick of Ephraim in modern Revelation. Chapter 3, verse 5, the phrase, Joseph truly saw our day. Joseph of Egypt was a marvelous and visionary prophet, though only a fragment of the patriarchal blessing given him by his father Jacob has been preserved for us the Bible. We know from that source that Joseph was promised that he would be a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. This verse, as with countless others, is a close book to the rest of the world. Yet, to Latter-day Saints, its meaning is most plain. Joseph's descendants, representing both the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, would cross the ocean and come to what we know as the Americas. From Lehi, we learn that the ancient Joseph had seen the fulfillment of this promise in vision. Lehi knew this from what was preserved in the brass plates. What is apparently the same text has been restored to us by Joseph Smith in his inspired translation of Genesis 50. Here we learn that Joseph of Egypt told his family of the branch that was to be broken off and carried into a far country. Joseph assured his family that this branch that was broken off and hid from the knowledge of those in the old world would be highly favored of the Lord. He saw that the Messiah would be manifest to them in the last days in the spirit of power, and that they would be brought out of darkness into light, out of hidden darkness, and out of captivity into freedom. We would understand that promise includes both political and religious freedom. 
and that the descendants of Joseph are found in the Americas would join the church in great numbers in fulfillment of the covenants of the Lord to their ancient father. Ephraim and Manasseh, and mostly Ephraim, were the first to be gathered because it is Ephraim's job to gather out the rest of the house of Israel. So the burden lays upon Ephraim. So that's why we have mostly Ephraim in the church right now, so that they can go out, and as the other tribes come in, they can help Ephraim with finding the other branches of the house of Israel. Chapter 3, verse 6, the phrase, Joseph of Egypt also saw in vision the work and labors of the prophet Joseph Smith. Meaning, a knowledge of Joseph Smith and his role as the great prophet of the Restoration was had by many of the ancient prophets, but none was it known in greater detail than his progenitor, Jacob's son, Joseph. Here the latter-day Joseph was referred to as a choice seer unto the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. One characteristic of a seer is his ability to see and know the past. No prophet in earth's history has done more to restore a knowledge of the great spiritual events of the past than Joseph Smith. Through him we receive a spiritual history of the ancient inhabitants of the Americas, along with revealed histories from the dispensations of Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and restored texts from the pen of John the Baptist and John the Revelator, representing the meridian of time. Indeed, to our knowledge, no prophet has penned more scripture than Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith is the great seer of the latter days. The prophet Joseph Smith is the choice seer described in 2 Nephi 3.6 as a descendant of Joseph, the son of Israel. Chapter 3, verse 7, Brigham Young bore witness of the choice seer, Joseph Smith, who was known not only in the days of Joseph in Egypt, but even before the creation of the world. Quoting President Young, quote, It was decreed in the councils of eternity long before the foundations of the earth were laid that he, Joseph Smith, should be the man in the last dispensation of this world, to bring forth the word of God to the people and receive the fullness of the keys and power of the priesthood of the Son of God. The Lord had his eye upon him and upon his father and upon his father's father and upon his progenitors clear back to Abraham and from Abraham to the flood and from the flood to Enoch and from Enoch to Adam. He has watched that family and that blood as it has circulated from its foundation to the birth of that man. He, the prophet Joseph Smith, was foreordained in eternity to preside over this last dispensation. What a powerful statement concerning this great prophet Joseph Smith, whom we revere. Praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. Elder Neil A. Maxwell suggested several examples of truths that the seer Joseph Smith could see with spiritual eyes that had previously been hid from the world. One, revelation about the extent and expanse of the universe. Two, revelation about God's central purpose. Three, revelation about us as God's children. Four, revelation about man's destiny. Five, revelation about God's personal involvement with his children. Six, revelation about the expanse of the Savior's atonement. Those are some great doctrines, some plain and precious truths that had been left out of the scriptures concerning Joseph Smith. Chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, the phrase, A choice seer will I raise up, meaning the restored gospel forges a welding link between this and all past dispensation. It centers in bringing scattered Israel to the knowledge of the covenants which the Lord made with their ancient fathers. The primary fulfillment of this promise was found in the translation and publication of the Book of Mormon. 
chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, he shall be great like unto Moses. As Joseph of Egypt prophetically unfolded the events that lay in the immediate future for Israel, he told his family how these events were but the pattern or foretelling of events of the last days, foreseeing Israel's more immediate bondage to the Egyptians and their deliverance by a prophet of God as a parallel to their bondage to darkness in the last days and their deliverance once again by a heaven-sent servant, he wove the two stories together as one. The cycle of events common to both stories include Israel's prophesied bondage and the coming of a prophet who was together liberate and lead them. These liberator prophets were not to be confused with the Messiah, Joseph cautioned, for they would be his servants. They were to be seers, revelators of gospel law, and would be foreknown by name. Each would write the word of the Lord and declare them with the aid of a spokesman. Chapter 3, verse 11, the phrase convincing them of my word, which shall have already gone forth. A primary purpose of the Book of Mormon is to convince the world that the testimony and teachings of the Bible are true. There are a great many who do not believe in the teachings of the Bible because there is no other witness to back them up, but we have that. Will Durant, in his volume, Caesar and Christ, makes the following comment as his introduction to a consideration of the historicity of Christ and the Gospels. So, quoting Will Durant, one of the most far-reaching activities of the modern mind has been the higher criticism of the Bible, the mounting attack upon its authenticity and veracity, countered by the heroic attempt to save the historical foundations of Christian faith, the results may in time, in time prove as revolutionary as Christianity itself. The first emergent in this 200-year war was fraught in silence by Hermann Remaris, professor of Oriental language at Hamburg, that would be Germany, on his death in 1768. He left cautiously unpublished a 1,400-page manuscript on the life of Christ. Six years later, Gotthold Lessing, over the protests of his friends, published portions of it as the Wolfenbüttel fragments. Remaris argued that Jesus can only be regarded and understood not as the founder of Christianity, but as the final and dominant figure in the mystical esthology of the Jews. That is, Christ thought not of establishing a new religion, but of preparing men for the imminent destruction of the world and God's last judgment of all souls. In 1796, Herder pointed out the apparently irreconcilable difference between Christ of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Christ of the Gospel of St. John. In 1828, Heinrich Paulus summarized the life of Christ in 1,192 pages, proposed a rationalistic interpretation of the miracles, that is, accepted their occurrence but ascribed them to natural causes and powers. In an epic-making life of Christ, 1835-36, David Strauss rejected this compromise. The supernatural elements in the Gospels, he thought, should be classified as myths, and the actual career of Christ must be reconstructed without using these elements in any form. Strauss's most massive volumes made biblical criticism the storm center of German thought for a generation. In the same year, Ferdinand Christian Bauer attacked the epistles of Paul, rejecting as unauthentic all but those to the Galatians, Corinthians, and Romans. In 1840, Bruno Bauer began a series of passionately controversial works aiming to show that Jesus was a myth, the personified form of a cult that evolved in the second century from a fusion of Jewish, Greek, and Roman theology. 
In 1863, Ernest Renan's Life of Jesus, alarming millions with its rationalism and charming millions with its prose, gathered together the results of German criticism and brought the problem of the gospel before the entire educated world. The French scholar reached its climax at the end of the century in the Abbey Loisi, who subjected the New Testament to such rigorous textual analysis that the Catholic Church felt compelled to excommunicate him and other modernists. Meanwhile, the Dutch school of Pearson, Neighbor, and Matthias carried the movement to its furthest point by laboriously denying the historical reality of Jesus. And German author Dues gave his negative conclusion, its definitive exposition, 1906. And in England, W.B. Smith and Jan Robertson argued to a like denial. The result of two centuries of discussion seemed to be the annihilation of Christ. So you can see the German school of biblical criticism and the French schools and others were trying to show that the Bible was a work of fiction, of mythology, and not true. No wonder we needed the Book of Mormon to correlate with the Bible and say, no, there was a man named Moses. He did divide the Red Sea. There was a prophet, Joseph, Adam, Noah, all of that. Thank goodness for the Book of Mormon. The story of biblical scholarship for the past two or more centuries surely evidences the wisdom of God in bringing forth the Book of Mormon in defense of the testimony of Christ and the message of the Bible. It is also some considerable significance that the prophecy explicitly stated that we are to use the Book of Mormon to prove the Bible rather than the Bible to prove the Book of Mormon. This principle was reiterated in the revelation that directed Joseph Smith to organize the church, having announced that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel, that it has come by inspiration, and that Jane Angels had testified of its truthfulness. The Lord then said it came forth proving to the world that the Holy Scriptures are true, that God, God does inspire men and call them to his holy work in this age and generation, as well as in generations of old, thereby showing that he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Thus the Lord declared that the Book of Mormon has been given as tangible proof that the Bible is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and that God and the gospel are the ever are ever the same. When we use the Book of Mormon, a preference to the Bible and teaching the gospel to those not of our faith, it has the effect of removing us from the arena of argument over the meaning of biblical texts. To center attention on the Book of Mormon is to pursue a path which leads to the sacred grove, that place where the heavens are opened and sure answers given to honest truth seekers. Chapter 3, verse 12, the phrase shall grow together, meaning it is only when the Bible and the Book of Mormon are used as one that we gain the power to confound false doctrines, bring an end to contentions, and establish the pure peace of the gospel. Did you catch that? It's only when we use the Bible and the Book of Mormon together. Brothers and sisters, we were never meant to exclusively study the Book of Mormon in our church, and that's all, and leave the Bible undone. But that's what I see mostly in this church, that we are biblically illiterate, and we need to do a better job with that. In the historical sense, the Bible has been a book of war and bloodshed as men and nations have quarreled over its meaning. Innumerable martyrs have been left in its wake, and Europe was virtually torn asunder. The Book of Mormon, standing as an independent witness to the Bible with its purity of translation and clarity of language, is the harbinger of peace. Through the Book of Mormon, those naturally of Israel come to the knowledge of their fathers and of the covenants to which they are rightful heirs. Its pages give all readers the knowledge of the covenants of salvation and invite their participation in them. 
Chapter 3, verse 13, the phrase, out of weakness, he shall be made strong. This is referring to, as David defeated Goliath, so the weak things of the earth are destined to put an, at naught the wisdom of the mighty. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the Lord declared, and will bring to nothingness the understanding of the prudent. As to those whom he calls to labor in his vineyard, we are told that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. And things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Greatest example would be Joseph Smith. So uneducated, he would be considered a thing of naught and just foolishness among the scholars of that day. But look what he did for Joseph Smith and how much Joseph Smith gave to us in doctrine of godliness and the godhood and his gospel. And by the end, Joseph was teaching the learned men the true meaning of the Bible by the time God got done with him. In the revelation known as the voice of warning, the Lord promised that the weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, that man should not consider his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh. This so that faith might increase, the everlasting covenant be established, and the gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world, and before kings and rulers. To Joseph Smith the Lord said, I raise you up, and I might show forth my wisdom through the weak things of the earth. And boy, has he done that. Chapter 3, verse 14. The phrase, they that seek to destroy him shall be confounded, referring to in Moroni's initial instruction to Joseph Smith, the youthful prophet was told that when it became known that he had the records from which the Book of Mormon would come, the workers of iniquity would seek his overthrow. Quote, they will circulate falsehoods to destroy your reputation, also seek to take your life, end of quote. Moroni said, but remember this, if you are faithful and shall hereafter continue to keep the commandments of the Lord, you shall be preserved to bring these things forth. Years later, Joseph would write that envy and wrath of man have been my common lot all the days of my life. That is so true. Joseph went through so much persecution. At a time when there seemed little hope, the prophet, being incarcerated in Liberty Prison, and the Lord spoke to him, saying, Hold on thy way, and thy priesthood shall remain with thee, for their bounds are set, having reference to his enemies, they cannot pass. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. Joseph, I will let you accomplish all that you were sent down here to accomplish, in other words. Chapter 3, verse 15, his name shall be called after me, meaning in patriarchal times, personal names were considered to be of great importance. Conscious effort was made to assure identity between the name and its bearer. Often names would constitute a miniature biography of the bearer. Names were also used as reminders of significant events to connote character traits, to identify position, and in some instances to foreshadow the bearer's destiny or that of his posterity. Thus names were used as memorials, as symbols, and as prophecies. Among righteous people's names were used to identify and testify of great truths or even great events, thus keeping such things constantly in the consciousness of of the people. The etymology of the name Joseph is usually given as the Lord abideth, or may God add, or increaser. That's usually the translation of the name Joseph. Though appropriate, such renderings have veiled a richer meaning associated with the name. 
In Genesis 30, verse 24, where Rachel names her infant son Joseph, the Hebrew text reads, Asaph, which means he who gathers or he who causes to return. Or perhaps most appropriately, God gathereth. Thus, the great prophet of the Restoration was given the name that most appropriately describes his divine calling. Chapter 3, verse 15, the phrase, after the manner of his father. This has reference to Joseph Smith Sr. The prophet's father was the first to hold the office of patriarch in this dispensation. Such was his right by birth, he being the oldest man of the blood of Joseph meaning that he was the oldest direct lineal descent of Joseph of Egypt on earth at the time. How appropriate that the first patriarch, head, or prince of the tribe, should bear the name of his ancient forefather who saw and prophesied of him. Chapter 3, verse 15, the phrase, He shall be likened to me. Extensive parallels can be drawn between Joseph of Egypt and Joseph Smith. Let it suffice for our purpose to say that as the ancient Joseph gathered his family in Egypt and saved them from the famine that then covered the earth, so the latter day Joseph served as a savior to the house of Israel, gathering them together that they might be given the food of everlasting life. Chapter 3, verse 16, the phrase, I will preserve thy seed forever. In our Genesis text, we read that the Lord swore unto Joseph that he would preserve his seed forever, and that it would be done unto him in the last days, even as the Lord has sworn. Chapter 3, verse 18, the phrase, Who are the different people spoken of in these verses? Elder Bruce R. McConkie identified the people spoken of in 2 Nephi 3, 18 as follows, quote, Note the words of the Lord. And behold, I, and I behold, I will give unto him, Mormon, that he shall write the writing of the fruit of thy loins, the Nephites, unto the fruit of thy loins, the Lamanites, and the spokesman of thy loins, Joseph Smith, so Joseph Smith is Mormon's spokesman, shall declare it. That is, Mormon wrote the Book of Mormon, but what he wrote was taken from the writings of the Nephite prophets, and these writings, compiled into one book, were translated by Joseph Smith and sent forth by him unto the Lamanites. So the spokesman spoken of in this verse is Joseph Smith being a spokesman to Mormon who edited the plates. Chapter 3, verse 19, the phrase, The words which are expedient shall go forth. We need not know all the doings of the agents. We do, however, need to know those principles by which they obtain their salvation. Such are the principles by which men in all ages must lay claim to the rewards of eternal life. Chapter 3, verse 20, they cry from the dust, meaning the testimony of the dead shall live. The dead in the Book of Mormon live today through that book. Chapter 3, verse 21, the phrase, the weakness of the words will I make strong. The scriptures are but black ink on white paper. It is the power of the Spirit that breathes into them the breath of life and gives them meaning in the lives of those that read them in purity and in faith. Chapter 3, verse 23, they shall hearken unto the words of this book, meaning, Initially, Lehi promised his son Joseph that if his seed would not utterly be destroyed, now he assured him that they would be numbered among those who would accept and believe in the Book of Mormon when it would come forth. Theirs would be believing blood. Chapter 3, verse 24 Lehi recapitulates the promise to the seed of Joseph of Egypt, emphasizing the role of the choice seer, whom we know to be the prophet Joseph Smith, the great prophet of the Restoration. Let's now turn our attention to chapter 4 in 2 Nephi. Chapter 4, verse 2, the phrase, He truly prophesied concerning all his seed. 
This is referring to the stature of Joseph of Egypt as a prophet remains little known even to Latter-day Saints. From the text restored by Joseph Smith to the book of Genesis, we learn that Joseph enjoyed the personal presence of the Lord Jehovah who covenanted with him relative to his posterity by the way of an immutable oath. In this prophecy, quoted in part by Lehi to his son Joseph in the preceding chapter, we learn that he knew of the destiny of Lehi and his family and the destiny of Joseph Smith. The detail of the knowledge had by the ancient Joseph is remarkable. As an illustration, Joseph Smith, in blessing Oliver Cowdery, said that Oliver would be blessed according to the blessings of the prophecy of Joseph in ancient days, which he said should come upon the seer of the last days, and the scribe that would sit with him and that should be ordained with him by the hands of the angel in the bush unto the lesser priesthood and after he should receive the holy priesthood under the hands of those who had been held in reserve for a long season, even those who received it under the hands of the Messiah, while he should dwell in the flesh upon the earth, and should receive and the blessings with him, even the seer of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saith he, even Joseph of old. See, isn't that interesting? Even Joseph of Egypt knew of Oliver Cowdery and his role as a scribe and getting the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood. Thus we see that Joseph of Egypt knew not only of Joseph Smith and his role as the great prophet of the Restoration, but also of Oliver Cowdery's role as Joseph's scribe in bringing forth the Book of Mormon, and that Oliver Cowdery would be Joseph's companion when the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods were restored. It may well be that ancient Joseph knew more of our day than we do. Further, we are aware that Joseph of Egypt was the author of a scriptural record which will someday be restored to those of the house of faith. There is a book of Joseph out there that someday we will get. We anticipate that the prophecies of Joseph contained therein will have much to say about the roles of Ephraim and Manasseh in the gathering of Israel in the last days. Chapter 4, verses 3 through 12, Lehi blessed his family. To the end of his life, Lehi taught his children the gospel. In our day, the Lord's servants continue to emphasize parents' responsibility to teach their children. The first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve declared, We warn that individuals who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God. Boy, may we heed that warning. Like Lehi, most Latter-day Saints' parents take their responsibilities very seriously. As our M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, how our focus on the importance of families should impact our parenting, quote, Our family-centered perspective should make Latter-day Saints strive to be the best parents in the world. It should give us enormous respect for our children, who are truly are our spiritual siblings, and it should cause us to devote whatever time is necessary to strengthen our families. Indeed, nothing is more critical connected to happiness, both our own and that of our children, than how well we love and support one another within the family. End of quote. You can see why Satan is doing so much to destroy the family. Because of Lehi's righteousness, because of his prayers and labors, which would continue on the other side of the veil, the promise was granted to the seed of Laman and Lamiel that in generations far distant, even their seed should return to the fold and enjoy the fullness of gospel blessings. The powerful of a righteous man to bless his family and to labor in their behalf is not limited to mortality, nor is it limited to the generation in which the man lived. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, Laman, Laman's and Lemuel's children. God has fulfilled and continues to fulfill Lehi's promise of mercy to Laman's and Lemuel's children. There are several cases in the Book of Mormon where Lehi's promise to the children of Laman and Lemuel were fulfilled. In the latter days, God has continued to fulfill Lehi's promise of mercy to Laman and Lemuel's children. President Henry B. Iring of the First Presidency explained, quote, 
our faithful effort to offer to our family the testimony we have of the truth will be multiplied in power and extended in time. We have all seen evidence of that in families we have known. I saw it in South America as I looked into the faces of missionaries. Hundreds of them passed by me, shaking my hand and looking deeply into my eyes. I was nearly overwhelmed with the confirmation that these children of Father Lehi and of Sariah were there in the Lord's service because our Heavenly Father honors His promises to families. To nearly his last breath, Lehi taught and testified and tried to bless his children. Terrible tragedy came among his descendants when they rejected his testimony, the testimonies of other prophets and of the scriptures. But in the eyes of the face of those missionaries, I felt confirmation that God had kept his promises to reach out to Lehi's covenant children and that he will reach out to ours. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 13, angry with me because of the admonitions of the Lord. This is referring to when God speaks, the righteous rejoice. Whenever his admonitions, they are received with thanksgiving. Surely God speaks for no other purpose than to edify and bless his children. By contrast, his words are a constant source, source of annoyance and offense to the rebellious. Offended with the message, they spew their anger upon the messenger, thus shielding themselves from the reality that their offense is with God. That is who they really are offended at and hate is God when it comes down to it. Chapter 4, verse 15, the phrase, I write these things of my soul and many scriptures. Nephi, who is writing scripture, cannot do so without quoting scripture. Revelation, past and present, are perfect companions. Surely Joseph Smith, in recording the mind and will of the Lord to those of our day, laced his expressions with the language of ancient prophets. This has the effect of binding those of the household of faith of all ages and generations into one great family. Verse 15, the phrase, my heart pondereth them, meaning truth is often felt before it is understood. Though the mind and the, tongue, and the tongue may lack the ability to articulate a principle, it may still be fully understood by the heart. President Harold B. Lee frequently described the growth of testimony as the process by which a person's heart tells him things his mind is yet to understand. The union of heart and mind is necessary to an understanding of the word of the Lord. Eternal truths cannot be comprehended by the intellect alone, nor, on the other hand, is gospel understanding to be mindless. By definition, revelation is that which comes to the heart and mind by the power of the Holy Ghost. Read D&C 8, verses 2 through 3, where he says, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart. So when our mind and hearts agree together, then that is revelation from God. If my mind and heart do not agree, then that's not from God and do not follow it. Chapter 4, verse 16, the phrase, My soul delighteth in the scriptures. Sister Cheryl C. Lamp, primary general president, discussed how 2 Nephi 4.15 reveals three ways we can effectively read the scriptures. First, delight in the scriptures. Second, pondering the scriptures. And third, writing the scriptures into our lives. This scripture teaches us how to read the Book of Mormon. It mentions three important ideas. This is quoting Sister Lent. First, my soul delighteth. I love this phrase. I have thought about hungering and thirsting after knowledge as I read the scriptures. But delighting in them is something else. I find that what I take away from the scriptures is determined by what I bring. Each time I read them, I am, in a sense, bringing a new person with new eyes to the experience. Where I am in my life, the experiences I am having, and my attitude all affect how much I will gain. I love the scriptures. I treasure the truths I find as I read them. Joy fills my heart as I receive encouragement, direction, comfort, strength, and answers to my needs. Life looks brighter and the way opens before me. I am reassured of my Heavenly Father's love and concern for me every time I read. 
Surely this is a delight to me. As one little boy in a sun, sunbeam class put it, I feel happy about the scriptures. Second, my heart pondereth them. How I, love, how I love to carry the scriptures with me in my heart. The spirit of what I have read rests there to bring me peace and comfort. The knowledge I have gained gives me gratitude and direction. I have the confidence born out of obedience. Third, I, of course, do not write scripture as did Nephi, but when I read the scriptures and I live the principles I learn those scriptures become written in my life. They govern my actions and are written there for my children to see and follow. I can build a legacy, a tradition of righteous living, based on the principles I learn in the scriptures. End of her quote. Chapter 4, verse 16, My heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. This is referring to, It is one thing to have a revelation, and quite another to understand it. The Pharaoh of Egypt dreamed a dream, but could not interpret it. Belshazzar saw the hand of the Lord write a message upon a wall, but could not translate it. The world is full of people who have the Bible, but understand little of any of its heaven-sent message. Nephi saw a marvelous vision in his youth and spent a lifetime growing in his understanding of it. Chapter 4, verses 15 through 35 are usually referred to as the Psalm of Nephi. A psalm is an inspired poem or hymn. Even those who do not have an understanding of ancient Hebrew poetry can recognize and relate with the heartfelt pleading of Nephi's psalm in 2 Nephi 4. Psalms are to be read out loud. Try reading Nephi's psalms aloud to sense the spirit which was written. This is also true of Isaiah, I have found, that if you will read Isaiah out loud, you have a very different experience because his writings are very poetic. Chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, O wretched man that I am. The idea that prophets or their writings are infallible is an old sectarian notion and is false. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Elijah, we are told, was a man subject to like passions as we are. When an attempt was made to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods, they forbade the people, saying, We also are men of like passions with you. Never has there been a prophet who has been excused from the frailties and temptations of the flesh. We see in Nephi a keen sensitivity to his weakness and a spirit that could not look upon sin, save it were with an abhorrence. Throughout the Book of Mormon, we know Nephi's righteousness, his faithfulness and tribulation, his dedication to God, but still he exclaimed, O wretched man that I am. I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do easily beset me. The prophet Joseph Smith quote taught that, ta taught that quote, the nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater his enjoy enjoyments till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin. End of quote. Perhaps Nephi felt burdened by what we might consider trivial weaknesses to the point where they caused him sorrow and he sought to be free from the vestige of sin. Nephi's heartfelt plea for the Lord to help him overcome his weaknesses helps us understand how to conquer our own weaknesses. Personal experience teaches us of our need to do likewise. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles reminded us why we are commanded to repent and admonished us to take advantage of the Lord's redeeming power. Quote, why have our Father and His Son commanded us to repent? Because they love us. They know all of us will violate eternal laws, whether they be small or large. Justice requires that every broken law be satisfied to retain the promise of joy in this life and the privilege of returning to the Father in heaven. If not satisfied in the day of judgment, justice will cause that we be cast out of the presence of God to be under the control of Satan. It is our Master and His redeeming act that makes it possible for us to avoid this condemnation. It is done through faith in Jesus Christ, obedience to His commandments, and in 
righteousness, enduring in righteousness to the end. Are you taking full advantage of the redeeming power of repentance in your life so that you can have greater peace and joy? Feeling a turmoil and despondency awful signals a need for repentance. Also, the lack of the spirit direction you seek in your life could result from broken laws. If needed, full repentance will put your life together. It will solve all the complex spiritual pains that come from transgression. But in this life, it cannot remedy some of the physical consequences that can occur from serious sin. Be wise and constantly live well within the boundaries of righteousness to find the Lord. End of quote. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that, regardless of a person's susceptibility or tendency, we have an obligation to exercise our agency to overcome our personal weaknesses. Quote, Perhaps these persons, as the saying goes, were born that way. But what does that mean? Does it mean that persons with susceptibilities or strong tendencies have no choice, no free agency in these matters? Our doctrine teaches otherwise. Regardless of a person's susceptibility or tendency, his will is unfettered. He, his free agency is unqualified. It is his freedom that is impaired. We are all responsible for the exercise of our free agency. Most of us are born with thorns in the flesh, some more visible, some more serious than others. We all seem to have susceptibilities to one disorder or another. But whatever our susceptibilities, we have the will and power to control our thoughts and our actions. This must be so. God has said that he holds us accountable for what we do, what we think. So our thoughts and actions must be controllable by our agency. Once we have reached the age of or a condition of accountability, the claim I was born that way does not excuse actions or thoughts that fail to conform to commandments of God. We need to learn how to live so that a weakness that is mortal will not prevent us from achieving the goal that is eternal. God has promised that he will consecrate our afflictions for our gain. The efforts we expend in overcoming any inherent weakness build a spiritual strength that will serve us throughout eternity. Thus, when Paul prayed thrice that his form and the flesh would depart from him, the Lord replied, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. End of Elder Oaks's quote. Chapter 4, verses 20 through 25, as already mentioned, verses 17 through 35 appear to be a poem. These particular verses, 20 through 25, are a psalm of praise and thanksgiving. There is a beauty and a spirit in good religious poetry and music that lifts the soul. The honest in heart could hardly read Nephi's psalm, taste its spirit, and then be critical of the Book of Mormon. Inspired poetry and music are especially attractive to the spirit and do much to rate the spiritual level of our worship services. Chapter 4, verse 25, carried away upon an exceedingly high mountain, referring to, to be carried away by the spirit to the high mountain was an experience Nephi shared in common with many of the spiritual giants of past ages. Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain, and he saw God face to face and talked with him. Ezekiel was carried forth from Babylon into a vision to the land of Israel and sat there upon a very high mountain to see a future temple. Jesus was in the spirit, and it taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Others of the prophets speak of being carried by the spirit into vision to heavenly temple, to the heavenly temple of which the high mountain is but the symbol. Isaiah and John the Revelator are examples. The phrase, I was bidden that I should not write them, meaning all who have been entrusted with a high mountain or temple experience have been given knowledge that they are not at liberty to share. There are many sacred truths revealed to those worthy and ready to receive them that are not lawful for man to utter Neither is man capable to make them known, for they are only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Spirit, which God bestows upon those whom 
who love him and purify themselves before him. Chapter 4, verses 26 through 30. O Lord, I will praise thee forever. Salvation is not the promised end of some spiritual experiences, no matter how marvelous it may have been. None in our dispensation, and few who have ever walked the earth, have been the recipient of more spiritual experiences, more heavenly manifestations than the prophet Joseph Smith. By way of personal warning, the Lord reminded him that although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and set at naught the counsels of God and follow after the dictates of his own carnal of his own will and carnal desire, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. The warning is to all, for the Lord has said, there is a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall in temptation. Yea, even let those who are sanctified take heed also. Chapter 4, verses 31 through 35, the phrase, O Lord, wilt thou redeem my soul? Meaning the most noble of souls, the greatest of prophets, need heaven's help to endure in faith to the end. Joseph Fielding Smith, even in his 95th year and notwithstanding his position as the president of the church, frequently said, I pray that I may be true and faithful to the end. Never have such sentiments been stated more beautifully than they are in the present text by Nephi. Chapter 4, verse 31, Redeem My Soul. A soul that has been redeemed is one that has been freed from the dominion and power of the adversary. The redeemed are those made clean by the suffering of the Lamb and by their obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. These are they who have overcome the world by faith and are worthy to enter into the presence of the Lord. The phrase, deliver me out of the hands of mine enemies, meaning salvation is nothing more nor less than to triumph over all our enemies and put them under our feet. And when we have power to put all enemies under our feet in this world and a knowledge to triumph over all evil spirits in the world to come, then we are saved. In the case of Jesus, who was to reign until he had put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy was death. Chapter 4, verse 32. My heart is broken, my spirit is contrite. A broken heart and contrite spirit is synonymous with godly sorrow for sin and a complete submission to the will of God. It is most perfectly captured in the expression of the Savior in the Grand Council of Heaven. Father, thy will be done, and thy glory be thine forever. That was a quote from the Savior. Again, we find its perfect expression in Mary's response to Gabriel's announcement that she is to bear the will of God. She said, quote, Be it unto me according to thy word. The phrase strict in the plain road, meaning gospel covenants are to be lived with exactness and honor. Honor, it is not for man to dictate the terms of salvation. Too many have been too willing to rewrite the terms of eternal covenants into which they have entered. It has been observed that to almost live the commandments is to almost receive the promised blessings. Isn't that, wouldn't that be the saddest thing? Well, I almost live the commandments. And then the Savior having to say, well, I almost will bless you. That would be heartbreaking. Chapter 4, verse 33. The robe of thy righteousness phrase, meaning the stain of sin in Scripture is seen as being unremovable, thus the need to be clothed in robes of righteousness to cover our sins that we have repented of. Hence, Nephi's plea that he be encircled about in the robes of righteousness. Other scriptures support this idea. Second Nephi 9, 13-14 says, Oh, how great the plan of our God! For on the other other hand, the paradise of God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous, and the grave deliver up the body of the righteous, and the spirit in the body is restored to itself again. And all men become incorruptible and immortal, 
and they are living souls, having a perfect knowledge like unto us in the flesh, save it be that our knowledge shall be perfect. Wherefore, we shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt, and our uncleanliness, and our nakedness. And the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment, and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even with the robe of righteousness. Doctrine and Covenants, section 109, 72-76 says, Remember all the church, O Lord, with all their families and all their immediate connections, and with all the sick and afflicted ones, with all the poor and meek of the earth, that the kingdom which thou hast set without hands may become a great mountain and fill the whole earth, that thy church may come forth out of the wilderness of darkness and shine forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, and be ordained as a bride for that day when thou shalt unveil the heavens and cause the mountains to flow down at thy presence, and the valleys to be exalted, the rough places made smooth, that thy glory may fill the earth, that when the trump shall sound for the dead, we shall be caught up into the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with thee, that our garments may be pure, that we may be clothed upon with robes of righteousness, with palms in our hand, psalm, palms in our hands, and crowns of glory upon our heads, and reap eternal joy for all our suffering. Palms, that means palm branches in our hands. You can see, brothers and sisters, we need the robe of righteousness to cover our sins. That can only come through obedience, repentance, and complete submission to the will of God. Chapter 4, verse 35, if I ask not amiss, that phrase means we assume a responsibility in prayer for the desire of our hearts. Both could prove a great cursing if we are not wise. Draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you, the Lord said. Seek me diligently, and you shall find me. Ask, and you shall knock. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, it shall be given unto you. That is expedient for you. And if you ask for anything that is not expedient for you, it shall turn to your condemnation. So learn through the Spirit what is expedient that we should ask for. We now turn to our last chapter, 2 Nephi chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 2, they did, the phrase, they did seek to take away my life. Surely Nephi was not without fault. Yet, if the question is one of discerning spirits, that hateful spirit that forever thirsts for the blood of the Lord's anointed can ever be identified as emanating from the prince of darkness. The promise of the Savior to the Meridian Twelve was that they would be hated by all nations for his sake. Has... <clears throat> has been the common lot of the faithful saints in all ages. One cannot do the Lord's work without offending the devil. And you certainly cannot do the work of the world and the devil without offending the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 3, We have had much trial because of him. Such expressions are common to those given up to wickedness. Typically, everyone and everything except them Selves are supposedly responsible for their difficulties. In fact, though the announcement of the heavens is that all accountable souls are agents unto themselves, an experience shows that most of our problems are of our own making. Chapter 5, verse 5, the phrase, The Lord did warn me, referring to, In countless instances, such warnings have been given to protect the faithful. Relative to his enemies, Joseph Smith was promised that bounds were set beyond which they could not pass, and that his days were known to the Lord, and that they would not be numbered less by the evil designs of the wicked. In principle, the same applies to all who are true and faithful to the covenants they have made with the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 6, the phrase, Who believeth in, revelations of, in the revelations of God. Referring to, as with Nephi and his brothers, so with Joseph Smith and those who oppose him, they refuse to accept the warning, warnings and revelations of God. Today, virtually every anti-LDS argument reduces itself to a rejection of modern and continuing revelation. 
Second Nephi chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, the phrase separate ourselves from the wicked, referring to there are times when it is necessary to physically free from evil, such as with Nephi and his followers. Notice that it was those who believed in the warnings and revelations of God who went with Nephi. In like manner today, those who hearken to the warnings and revelations of modern prophets are the ones who are spiritually following them. We may not always be able, however, to physically move ourselves away from wickedness. Elder Richard G. Scott shared how we can protect ourselves. Quote, God has provided a way to live in this world and not be contaminated by the degrading pressure there's evil agents spread throughout it. You can live a virtuous, productive, righteous life by following the plan of, procreate, of protection created by your Father in heaven. His plan of happiness, it is contained in the scriptures and in the inspired declarations of his prophets. Avoid worldliness, worldly wickedness. Know that God is in control. In time, Satan will completely fail to be, will, will clearly fail and be punished for his perverse evil. God has a specific plan for you. He will reveal parts of that plan to you as you look for it with faith and consistent obedience. His Son has made you free, not from the consequence of your acts, but free to make choices. God's eternal purpose is for you to be successful in this mortal life. No matter how wicked the world becomes, you can earn that blessing. Seek and be attentive to the personal guidance given to you through the Holy Spirit. Continue to be worthy to receive it. Reach out to others who stumble and are perplexed, not certain of which path to follow. End of quote. Isn't it great? He tells us that Satan will completely fail, brothers and sisters. We know who's going to win. So why would you ever want to wear the jersey of Satan's team when you know the outcome is he will fail? That is just mind-boggling that you would even want to go his direction when his destruction is assured and those that follow him. Chapter 5, verse 10. At this time of new beginnings, it was both natural and appropriate that the people of Nephi renew their covenant with God. Our forefathers did the same when it was necessary for them to flee into the wilderness. When the vanguard company of Mormon pioneers entered the Salt Lake Valley, one of their first actions was to rebaptize each other in the Great Salt Lake. The appearance of Christ in the Nephite nation in many of time and his ushering in of a new gospel dispensation was accompanied by a similar renewal of covenants. Chapter 5, verses 11 and 13. We did prosper exceedingly. In 2 Nephi 5, 11, and 13, Nephi told his people success in raising their flocks, herds, and crops. Often we assault prosperity with tangible blessings, such as wealth or material things of the world. President Heber J. Grant taught about what true prosperity is. Quote, when I say prosperity, I am not thinking of it in terms of dollars and cents alone. What I count as real prosperity is the growth in the knowledge of God and in the testimony and in the power to live the gospel and to inspire our families to do the same. That is prosperity of the truest kind. End of quote. Speaking about how paying tithing brings true pros prosperity, President James E. Faust of the First Presidency quoted an experience shared by Sister e Yeko Sikai, Sikai, quoting, My family and I were spending a day at the Japanese Alps National Park. I was pregnant with our fourth child and was feeling rather tired, so I laid down under the trees. I began to think about our financial problems. My heart became overwhelmed and I burst into tears. Lord, we are faith. We are full tithe payers. We have sacrificed so much. When will the windows of heaven open unto us and our burdens be lightened? I prayed with all my heart. Then I turned to watch my husband and children playing and laughing together. Suddenly the Spirit testified to me that my blessings were abundant and that my family was the greatest blessing Heavenly Father could give me. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 14, Nephi, a giant of faith, did not expect the Lord to protect his people, save they first made all appropriate pro 
precautions to protect themselves. This included, as we read, the making of many swords. Thus Nephi did in all his power to protect themselves so that the Lord would make up the difference. In a telestial world, you will have telestial problems which will cause telestial wars. Therefore, even Nephi, a mighty prophet, had to make swords to prepare because they leave in a telestial world. Chapter 5, verse 16, the phrase, And I, Nephi, did build a temple. The Lord's people have always been a temple-building people. Indeed, the temple is the focal point of true religion, the sacred ground ordained as the meeting place between God and man, the house of revelation, and the place of eternal covenants. It is commonly held by the Jews that there can be but one temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Scriptural writ testifies otherwise. From the days of the brother of Jared, the Lord's people have known that in the last days, two great temples would reach their spires to the heavens, one in Jerusalem and the other in the new Jerusalem of America. A covenant-centered religion required a covenant sanctuary. The fact that the Nephites constructed a temple suggests that they that all remnants of Israel, whether they had been scattered, if they possessed the priesthood, would have done likewise. Sacred works required sacred places, edifices, which my people, the Lord said, are always commanded to build unto my holy name. Chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Obedience brings blessings, disobedience cursings. Because of their jealousy and wickedness, Laman and Lamiel and all of like spirit cut themselves off from the heavens. Nephi and the faithful fled, taking with them the scriptures and the divine compass through which the Lord had directed and instructed the family. The followers of Laman rejected Christ as their king and his so chosen servant as his earthly counterpart. Their allegiance is with the prince of darkness. Their nation will become one of darkness. Chapter 5, verse 21, he ca caused the cursing to come upon them. Because of their iniquity, the Lamanite people were cursed with the skin of blackness. Our te text tells us that they were so cursed in order that they would not be enticing to the Laman Nephites. The Old Testament contains ample evidence that when the children of Israel marry outside the covenant, they are dissuaded from the worship of the true and living God and quickly embrace the idolatry and whoredoms of the Canaanites. The wickedness of this people caused the Spirit of the Lord to be withdrawn, bringing upon them a curse, in contrast to the blessings of heaven so freely being poured out upon the heads of the righteous. All who live in a state of rebellion are heirs to such a curse. A mark of that curse among the darkness was a dark skin. Chapter 5, verses 20 through 25, the Lamanites were cursed. No number one, what was the curse? The curse is clearly defined in verse 20 as being cut off from the presence of the Lord. They lost the priesthood. Two, what caused the curse? According to verse 21, the cause of the curse came because of their iniquity and hardness of hearts. Because since the days of Adam's fall, weaknesses has resulted in being cut off from the presence of the Lord. Number three, what was the mark or sign set upon the Lamanites? In Nephi's day, the curse of the Lamanites was that they were cut off from the presence of the Lord because of their iniquity. This meant that the Spirit of the Lord was withdrawn from their lives. When Lamanites later embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, the curse of God did no more follow them. The Book of Mormon also states that a mark of dark skin came upon the Lamanites after the Nephites separated from them. The nature and appearance of this mark are not fully understood. We don't have a complete explanation by Nephi of what it means. The mark initially distinguished the Lamanites from the Nephites. Later, as both the Nephites and the Lamanites each went through periods of wickedness and righteousness, the mark became irre irre irrelevant as an indicator of the Lamanites standing before God. This then seems that the dark skin was more metaphorical, describing righteousness versus wickedness rather than actual change in pigmentation. Prophets affirm in our day that dark skin is not a sign of divine disfavor or cursing. 
The church embraces Nephi's teaching that the Lord denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. President Russell M. Nelson declared the Lord has stressed his essential doctrine of equality, equal opportunity for his children. Differences in culture, language, gender, race, and nationality fade into insignificance as the faithful enter the covenant path and come unto our beloved Redeemer. End of quote. Number four, what was the result of the curse? Finally, in verse 24, we learn that the result of the curse, being cut off from the presence of God, is that they became an idle people full of mischief and s subtlety. One great blessing is that the curse is only valid as long as the people are wicked. If they repent, the curse of God will no more follow them. There are many examples of righteous Lamanites who repented and enjoyed the Spirit of the Lord. One of them even became a prophet, Samuel the Lamanite. For a more in-depth study of the mark of the curse being a blackness of skin, See the following address or HTP address by Brant A. Gardner. What does the Book of Mormon say by skin of blackness? He writes a comprehensive article on perhaps what it meant and, and, and what it didn't mean. And so I'd encourage you to look up that publication. Chapter 5, verse 24, did the phrase did seek in the wilderness for beasts of prey. Nephi denounced denunciation of the Lamanites does not focus on hunting wild animals from which they could obtain both meat and clothing. Rather, his attention is centered on their hunting beasts of prey. Apparently, they killed for sport, a practice strongly condemned in scriptures. You can see that in the Jules Smith translation of Genesis 9, 10 through 11. Chapter 5, verse 26, Consecrate. To consecrate is to set apart, to devote to, or to make holy. The implication of our present text is that Jacob and Joseph were called of God and set apart by the laying on of hands to preach and teach among their people. This is Jacob and Joseph who were younger brothers of Nephi. The phrase priests and teachers refers to priests and teachers in the Book of Mormon should not be confused with the office of priest or the office of teacher as known to us in the Aaronic priesthood today. It is believed that the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood did not exist among the Nephites unless it was brought during Christ's visit among them. Certainly before Christ there was no Aaronic priesthood because there were no Levites. There was just Manasseh and, and Ephraim. Chapter 5, verse 26 to 27, the phrase, after the manner of happiness. The prophet Joseph Smith explained that there is a path that leads to happiness. Quote, happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. End of quote. Now, that does not mean that once you obtain that happiness that all your problems go away. You can have obtained and live after the man of happiness and still have severe trials. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught similarly about happiness. Quote, the Lord wants us to be happy. Nephi said a great thing, and we lived after the manner of happiness. What a wonderful thing. I want my children to be happy. I want them to do well. I want them to live well and live rightly, properly, and in the same way, except that my Father in heaven love reaches beyond any power of love that I have. I think he wants his sons and daughters to be happy. Happiness comes from of righteousness. Wickedness never was happiness. Sin never was happiness. Selfishness never was happiness. Greed never was happiness. Happiness lies in living the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. End of President Hinckley's quote. Chapter 5, verses 28 through 34, the phrase, make other plates. It's at this point in Nephite history, the commandment came to begin a second set of records, the small plates. 
approximately 10 years after Lehi and his family left Jerusalem around 590 BC, Nephi was commanded to begin a record of his proceedings, the record we have come to know as the large plates. On this set of plates, he was to record such matters as the nature of the family's travels, the genealogy of his father, many of the prophecies of Lehi, the wars and struggles of his people, and the details of the reign of their kings. About 20 years later, Nephi was given an additional writing assignment. He was to begin a record which would concentrate upon spiritual matters, the dealings and revelations of God with the Lehites. This record, known to us as the small plates, covers the materials in the Book of Mormon from 1 Nephi through the Book of Omni, approximately 475 years of Nephite history. At the time of King Benjamin, Mosiah I, the small plates come to a close and the large plates were thereafter used to record both secular and spiritual doings. And I'm not sure if it's in this chapter, but in a later chapter, he will say, I was commanded to make other plates for which purpose I know not. Well, we know the purpose because Martin Harris is going to lose 116 pages. And God prepared for that over 2,000 years before it ever happened. Now, there is a God I can worship and have faith, a God who knows 2,000 plus years before something happens how to prepare for it. The, lost, the small plates would make up for the losing of the 116 pages of, of Martin Harris had. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you did, hit the like button.